What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. Welcome back to America Trends Podcast. John Krofsig joins me, Larry Rifkin, every Tuesday and Thursday. We post new material. John, how do we do it? What's sure. the secret sauce? The secret sauce. Well, that's why it's a secret. Well, Come on. and you're that's why well. you're being very saucy with me right now. <laughs> you're looking well. Well, you are too. Well, well I you. hope. I'll tell you, you know, we did a show years ago for public television called uh, Living Between Office Visits, Dr. Bernie Siegel. And I was reminded recently when a friend of mine, his uh, brother-in-law, went in for an appendectomy and they found that uh, there was a lot of cancer in his body. And uh, we just don't know often what really is going on when you say, well, you look well. And I saw this gentleman about two months ago. And he looked well. And, uh, you know, I don't know whether I should have one of those body scans. Have you ever thought about doing that? Uh, not really, no. No? No. no. I, 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 I like to stay away from doctors and hospitals and stuff like that as much as possible. <laughs> well, I understand that. But seriously, <laughs> the last thing that I want is to go in one day and find out that uh, everything really is, uh, you know, uh, chock full of cancer. I mean, I'd rather be able to get it early on. Right. Because the gentleman that I'm talking about has a condition now where he's got these small cancerous uh, uh, buildups all throughout his body. And, uh, boy, that's got to be the worst thing to find out when you think you're healthy until the moment that, if you feel good, yeah. I know, yeah. I know. So looking well is one thing. Being well is another. But yeah. Dr. Bernie Siegel used to tell us, hey, we're all living between office visits. <laughs> no, between blood screenings and readings. This is true. And I went for my PSA the other day, and all the guys out there, you know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a public service announcement. I am talking about the PSA. And I know a lot of people say, well, that's a lousy measurement of what's going on as it relates to prostate. But it's the best they've got. Well, at least you got some number to go by. Yeah, right. I mean, it may not be the best, but at least it's uh, it's what we got. Well, what they tell you is it's not your number per se. I've had cousins with pretty high numbers. It's really the movement of that number. If it goes from four to 10, right. that's what they worry about, that uh, velocity. But at least they got that baseline. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then, of course, you know, doctors still do the digital exam, John, yeah, the digital. I know. I know, I'm aware of that. I said to my doctor, <laughs> I said, could you at least take off your rings next time? <laughs> And then one time it actually wasn't too bad. And I said, Doc, is there anything I can do for you? You know, so. Well, look, we've been talking about our health. Yes. But now we're going to talk about the health of the American economy by virtue oh. of the skill set that we have available to us. I saw this really interesting article by Edward Kennard. And I had had him on the radio show uh, some years ago. What I remembered most explicitly was that he was a partner of Mitt Romney's <laughs> at Bain Capital. Well, there you go. Another big uh, Yeah, big money <laughs> my, guy. Yeah. But he wrote a book called The Upside of Inequality, How Good Intentions Undermine the middle class. Very interesting man. And he wrote this article that said, America's got talent. So it got my attention, (laughs) but not nearly enough. And I say this because, you know, Donald Trump would have you believe everybody we need, all the skills that we need, they're right here in America. And so we really don't need new workers. We really don't (laughs) need some of these innovators. And yet Michael Bloomberg has said from day one, from Jump Street, he kept saying, wait a minute, some of the most innovative minds come here and they go to Harvard Business School right. or they go to Caltech or they go to MIT. Why would we want to usher them out of the country just as we have prepared them uh, to be the economic engines going forward? Yeah. Well, it reminds me of the state we live in, how uh, 
for chaos. Years, how 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 for years we've heard we've got all this talent. <laughs> well, we did. We I mean, did. Connecticut really was the um, equivalent of Silicon Valley back in, well, let's say 1890. And we're still holding on to that. We, we really got are. That, that we got that 1890 uh, talent. Yeah, so most of those people, though, are, um, well, they're not quite here. Uh, they're here, but uh, in name only and in spirit. But, John, really, this is a serious issue because – I understand that we want skills-based immigration to some extent, and I've argued at times that that's not a bad idea, that we have to have enough visas for all the day laborers and all the farm needs that we have and other needs. But having said that, what about these really bright people who want to live in the United States, who want to use their brainage uh, to bring America greater economic uh, velocity? Why are we not uh, encouraging them to stay here? That's a very good question. Well, the other thing that he raises is the fact that so many of us are of an age where our productivity and our high earning days and our creative uh, period is over. Uh, Many of us who are baby boomers, or at least it's ebbing, and we're now starting to collect a whole lot of benefits that have accrued over the years. And he's saying very, very categorically that unless we start welcoming some of these workers from outside who have incredible skills, middle managers, managers, entrepreneurs, unless we hold on to them, we're not going to be able to continue uh, to keep uh, these obligations to the no, older you're folks. Right. Social security. Intact. You yeah. think about it. I mean, it's there's people got to stay in the system to pay for the other people, and you're absolutely right. That's going to be a big problem coming up in the future. And some of the things that he talks about with us on the podcast are really interesting about our educational system and how many of our folks fall outside that mean in terms of being really ready to become high achievers in our society and how others are producing people much more prepared to be these really creative geniuses that spark new innovation and new jobs. So I think people are going to find this to be a really interesting conversation. Conversation. I, I think it's really going to be a fascinating to listen to. All right. America's got talent, but it's not all about singing and dancing, John. I know that's what you think it's <laughs> that's about. A, that's what I thought it was a TV show. I know. America's <laughs> got talent. Welcome to America Trends, where talent <laughs> is so abundant. Well, at any rate, on loan from God. Oh, where did <laughs> we get God. that one from? Well, let's listen to Edward Kennard. Let's do that. And he's going to be talking about this issue in ways that I think are going to be eye-opening uh, to you and to you. Well, Edward Connard is with us here on americatrendspodcast.com, and it's a great pleasure to have you here. And uh, you wrote uh, something that really got my attention, and the headline started it, America's Got Talent, But Not Nearly Enough. Now, I know you're not talking about one of those reality shows. <laughs> well, I thought it was a clever title. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um Yes, I think the problem that you find in our economy is that when you look forward into the future, you see an enormous number of baby boomers retiring. Um, That's going to require a large increase in expenditures. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that they'll grow uh, 7 to 8% of GDP, which will drive government spending in total over 40% of GDP. That's going to require large uh, uh, tax increases which will slow growth. And at the same time, we have to defend ourselves against a growing Chinese economy, which will probably eclipse the size of the U.S. economy in 10 to 15 years. So we have to do more than simply pay for those baby boomers. Uh, We have to pay for them and be able to grow fast enough to still be able to defend ourselves when we're all done paying for them. So the argument I make in the op-ed is that in order to do that, our only viable op- opportunity for growth, growth large enough to solve the problem, is high-skilled immigration. That uh, tax policy and such will potentially produce faster growth, but the magnitude of that growth won't be nearly large enough to uh, to solve our problems in the long run. Well, when I heard Attorney General Sessions just the other day about DACA, I mean, you would sense that all the talent that we need here is right here in America, uh, that we need to unleash it, and that uh, we really want to limit the amount of outside capital in terms of human capital that comes into the country. 
Well, one thing you find that's very interesting, if you look at the ratio of high-scoring workers to low-scoring workers in the United States relative to other countries, in the United States we have about, and this is if you look at international tests, which are done by the uh, OECD, uh, which is a, a, a organization of all the highly developed uh, countries. They've administered tests to measure the academic act aptitude of workforces in different countries. In the United States, about 25% of the U.S. workforce scores in the top third on those tests and about 45% score in the bottom third. So we have one high-scoring worker for every two low-scoring workers. In Germany, it's about a third high, a third middle, a third at the bottom. So they have one high-scoring worker for every low-scoring worker, twice as many uh, workers as the United States. Scandinavia has three times as many workers, and Japan has almost five times as many workers, high-scoring workers to low-scoring workers. So we do have an issue that if you want to raise the productivity of low-skilled wages, it requires uh, high-skilled workers creating uh, uh, products that are competitive, uh, building processes that are competitive, supervising uh, low-skilled workers. And there's lots of other opportunities for high-skilled workers besides that. So, for example, they can become doctors and lawyers, which mm -hmm. don't really increase productivity, but do keep our economy uh, running. Or they can go to Silicon Valley and try to produce innovation and information technology, which largely increases the productivity of our most productive workers. And we've been very successful at doing that because we're able to, for example, produce almost 10 times as many unicorns, billion-dollar uh, privately held startups, as our counterparts in, uh, in Europe have mm. been able to do. So our institutions are very good at increasing the productivity of our most productive workers, but you know, we have to be worried that if we uh, affect the ratio of high-skilled to low-skilled, either positively or adversely, we, it will change, potentially change the productivity and wages of our low-skilled workers. So I argue rather than subtraction, taking people away, we'd be far better off if we want to grow and solve our problems in the future, which is to add more high-skilled high-skilled workers to the mix to try to drive the ratio up, increase the wages of our low-skilled workers, and meet the future needs of our retiring baby boomers and, uh, and defense needs. I think a lot of people sense that America somehow has a monopoly on brains because we come out with these incredible products and breakthroughs in medical technology. How much of that already is driven by our policies that have invited into America some of the best and the brightest from throughout the world to visit and be part of our university system and then stay in the United States? Well, it's certainly the case if you look at uh, if you look at uh, uh, Silicon Valley, for example, uh, something like seventy percent of the programmers are uh, uh, high skilled immigrants, and a very large percent of the uh, startup founders and CEOs are, are immigrants uh, as well. So it has paid played a uh, a very large role in in the in the success. And, you know, the other thing that people don't realize is we're Skyping a lot of these workers in and their <laughs> programmers and such in Romania and other places in the world. And we're not capturing the tax uh, uh, taxes that they pay. They pay about uh, the top 20 percent pay about uh, twenty five thousand dollars a year more in taxes than they consume in government services. We're not our waitresses don't get to wait on their tables. Our teachers don't get to teach their students. Our doctors don't get to attend to their medical needs. And so we're missing out on a lot of the value of those workers because they're sitting offshore, but nevertheless are, are working. Uh, they are working for the success of our, our companies. But uh, often I think a lot of that's captured by the shareholders and the and the innovators, not necessarily the lesser skilled workers in the United States. Now, Donald Trump did talk about, as part of his immigration policy, to make it skills based. So you are obviously happy with that. But he, at the same time, wants fewer green cards. And you say that would defeat the purpose. Well, I think it, two things. One is he sets the standard for skill so high that very few people can get over the bar. So I suggest that the top 5%, I think he's on about almost the top 2%, uh, as, as, as what people have calculated based on, on the criteria. So I would probably lower the criteria a little bit from where he is. But if we set the criteria high like that, then there's no reason to cut the number of green cards in half because the more high-skill workers we bring in, uh, ultra-high-skill workers, the more likely we are to 
to grow our economy. If you think we have about 125 million full-time workers, the top 5% is 5 or 6 million. We issue a million green cards a year. In fairly short order, we could potentially double the number of top 5% workers in our economy. I don't know if that would double the growth rate. And we might be fishing out a pool and one plus one is one and a half. There might be synergistic uh, value to increasing the, the the number of people and one plus one is two and a half. But we could potentially double the growth rate by doubling the number of ultra high skill workers in our in our knowledge based economy. And it's not that inconceivable. There's about seven billion non Americans in the world. The top five percent is three hundred and fifty million. Half of them are too, you know, we don't know who they are. Half are too young and too old. Half will probably never move here. But you get to a pool of about 40 to 50 million people to potentially draw from to get five or six million uh, uh, ultra high skill workers to double the, the growth rate, potential growth rate of our economy. You remind us that a lot of our best and brightest have moved out of engineering and some of the STEM fields like science, technology, math, toward business and law. And so we've got a lot of bright minds, but they're not necessarily going into these areas that are going to uh, create uh, this uh, high-tech future in all kinds of fields. Well, it's interesting. When you look at the rest of the world, they also are skewed in the other direction. They have many more STEM uh, majors and fewer uh, business majors. And what our economy has shown that the optimal mix actually has more business majors than the rest of the world has because we've been able to put our STEM workers to work and achieve much higher productivity than, say, Japan, which has many more STEM workers than we do and simply hasn't been able to produce uh, the productivity. So there's a real opportunity. The rest of the world, by the way, is racing to catch up by educating more and more business majors and, and such to, to build the infrastructure to be able to commercialize the technology. But there's a real opportunity for us to draw on the surplus in the rest of the world and the fact that it's unbalanced in their mix between STEM and business. They have more STEM, less business and grab those STEM majors and put them to work for our business majors. <laughs> and we have a lot of businesses that you believe and that we all see are international leaders, and oftentimes they'll employ these workers offshore, and we don't get the benefit of the income tax uh, revenues that they'd pay. Yes, it's, it's, it's frustrating to see that those, those workers are Skyped in on the phone. Uh, they're off there working in uh, Eastern Europe, for example, um, uh, they're generating demand in their local economies. They're paying taxes in their local economies. And when you look at similarly employed workers in the United States, they're producing way more tax revenues than they're consuming in government services. And we have a big problem going out into the future, which is we need a lot more tax revenue to pay for the retiring baby boomers. And if we don't produce that through growth, we're going to have to produce it through higher taxes, which is going to kill growth. Uh, uh, and, and those taxes have to be uh, uh, very, very large, probably over 40% of GDP ultimately, to pay uh, for the retiring baby boomers that, that are coming. So we, I believe that we are squandering one of our best opportunities for growth, and we've been squandering it for the last 10 years uh, because we have not been issuing a million green cards a year to uh, to the most skilled workers in the rest of the world. I know that Michael Bloomberg has been espousing this for a long period of time. Where are business leaders? Uh, they're very influential, though they've been quitting a lot of business councils that the president set up over other issues. But how adamant are they going to be about a policy that allows in more of these uh, highly competitive workers from wherever they are? Well, I think they've been supportive but I also think that they've been highly supportive of low-skilled immigration because they want, also want uh, low-cost workers. And so I think that uh, they have antagonized a lot of, you know, half of the electorate and over the issue of high versus low-skilled employment. And so I think you have this odd divide politically, which is the Democrats uh, want low-skilled uh, immigration because they're looking for the political clout and the votes that come with it. And the Republicans want low-skilled immigration because they want lower-cost, low-skilled labor. And so none of them have been able to reach a compromise where you say, uh, we'll, uh, let's, let's uh, take the uh, green cards and let's skew them much more towards high-skilled and away from low-skilled to put upward pressure on growth and low-skilled wages in our in our economy now, you know the Republicans often represent the most skilled workers, and those skilled workers are are opposed 
to increasing the supply of high skill workers because that might put pressure on high skill wages. Now, the objective of my op ed was not to increase the wages of high skill workers who've done pretty well over the last couple of decades relative to low skill workers. My objective was to solve a longer term problem, which is how do we pay for the baby boomers? How do we defend ourselves against the Chinese? and come out of this so that our children can enjoy an America which is strong, as strong as the America that we enjoyed as children. Edward Conard wrote a really fascinating piece in the Wall Street Journal recently. America's got talent, but not nearly enough. So the idea that, uh, and you say it's an error to suggest that a greater share of Americans can do these ultra-high-skilled jobs. Well, what if somebody said, well, why don't we just put a lot more emphasis on STEM and get a lot of our women into STEM? Uh, and we know that a lot of that is occurring. Uh, what, what would you say about that? So a couple things. First, I'm all for uh, doing everything we can to maximize the value of education in America. Uh, and I think we have in many ways squandered the potential there. And I don't think uh, high school immigration holds us back from trying to improve our educational, uh, our educational system. But at, at the same time, we've been trying for decades and we've seen no improvement in test scores whatsoever. We've been trying to persuade our most talented students to become STEM majors. They've pretty much migrated to becoming business and uh, uh, lawyers, and there are many, many very talented students who don't want to suffer through a career of, of STEM or business or law and have tended to move into history, English, uh, uh, humanities, etc., uh, they're rich enough to, to not have to do mathematics for the rest of their, uh, their lives. So I'm all for trying to encourage people to, to, for Americans to take those jobs and to get those educations and to get the kind of training that increases the productivity of, of lower skill workers. In fact, I think high talented workers have a moral obligation to try to employ low, low skill workers, but we've been trying for